And amen. Well, we're going to continue tonight in the time that we have here with this, that we have been on a covenant of blood. And uh, I've been teaching on a covenant of healing in healing school and then teaching on a covenant of blood uh, on Wednesday nights. And uh, there are things that uh, we start off and we say we always need to remember. Number one is I have a covenant. I have a covenant. Say that out loud. I have a covenant. That's that's number one. I have a covenant. You have a covenant. The second thing is the Bible is a covenant book sealed with blood on both ends. It's a covenant book sealed with blood on both ends. The blood covenant runs throughout the Bible and it binds the two covenants together. All right. There, there, there is no there is no separation of the first covenant and the second covenant. All right, the second the second covenant brought us into the first covenant and made those blessings and those benefits available to us. The the we'll say this more later, but the first covenant is an eternal covenant an everlasting covenant, but it can be expanded, all right? And it and it can be added to. And it was by the second covenant. So the the Bible is a covenant book sealed with blood on both ends. Thirdly, a covenant mindset is a requirement for strong faith. All right. Your faith is based on a covenant. Faith, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith is based on truth. All right. Uh, I've had people say, well, faith is based on facts. No, it's not. It's based on truth. Because what was a fact 40 years ago and was considered truth is not a fact today. And so it, it can't be considered true. All right. So facts change. Truth does not. Uh, a covenant is not merely an agreement. It's not merely a contract. A covenant is binding because of its nature. All right. When, when you go through some of the different paraphrases of the Bible, and I'm not going to name any because it might be your favorite, but when you go through some of the paraphrases, you've got to be careful because it talks about the agreement that God made. An agreement can be broken. All right. An agreement and a covenant are two different things. And so it's not just an agreement or a contract. A covenant is binding because of the nature of a covenant. And here's the nature. Covenant by definition is to cut. The Hebrew word berith is to cut. All right. In other words, you cannot have a biblical covenant without a cutting. You can't have a biblical covenant without without blood. You cannot infer covenant without cutting. You can't infer covenant without blood. Amen. In Genesis 15, uh, verse 8, Genesis 15, verse 8. And he, Abraham, Abram said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I will inherit it? The Lord has told him he would inherit the land that he was in. And he said unto him, take a heifer of three years old, a she goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took them and he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. Now, this is not a sacrifice to God. This is God cutting a covenant with Abraham. And, and notice what he had to do. He had to divide these animals. There was a cutting. There was a shedding of blood. For the covenant to be binding, there had to be bloodshed for it to be binding. The life of the animal was given in order to bind God to this covenant. Amen. That there are things that happened in redemption and God is bound to them by the blood of Jesus. One of those is, it's very simple. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is bound to that because of the blood of Jesus. 
And it doesn't matter how bad, how horrible the sin was. You name whatever sin you can name and the, the most horrible transgression you can come up with. If that person will repent and call on the name of the Lord, God will save them and set them free and deliver them and make them a new creature in Christ just as if it never happened because he's bound to that word by the blood. He's bound to it by the blood. Oh, glory to God. Woo, that was worth coming to church for right there. Ha <laughs> ha. The blood of the animal is the evidence of the covenant. The blood of the animal is the evidence of the covenant. Now, we see this in some other verses. Uh, Genesis 17. I'm trying to slow down a little bit because my wife said, you're just fire hosing us. And uh, hallelujah, I, you said machine gunning. Somebody else told me they felt fire hosed. Uh, and so, uh, but there's so much here. We're going to teach on this all year. There's just, there's so much here where this is concerned. Genesis 17 and verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, you shall keep my covenant. Notice, therefore, you and your seed after you in their generations. This is my covenant that you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of the foreskin and it shall be a token. This is important. It shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. It shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. Now, in nine times in this chapter, God called the covenant my covenant. Three times he calls it the everlasting covenant. Verse 7, verse 13, and verse 19. God called it the everlasting covenant. It's everlasting. Amen. And notice in verse 10 and 11, he said this cutting, this circumcision, notice he said it was a token of the covenant. A token of the covenant. And he said the token of the covenant would include a, 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 a cutting. It would include blood. Now, the cutting, this cutting, this act of circumcision was to be the token of the covenant. The word token is a sign or evidence. A sign or evidence. This was a remembrance of the covenant. Now, Every time they saw the evidence of circumcision in their bodies, it was evidence that they had a covenant with Almighty God. Understand, this token, this evidence, this proof was not so much to be seen by everybody as it was to be a personal remembrance that I have a covenant with Almighty God. Remember, that's the number one thing. You have a covenant. You always have to keep that in your mind, in, in your remembrance. So every time they saw that evidence, it was evidence they had a covenant with Almighty God and that they could expect Him to do what He promised. It, it's this expectation. This is, what, this is what encouraged David in his battle with Goliath. If, if you'll remember in 1 Samuel, you don't have to go there, 1 Samuel 17, Verse 26, David had showed up at the battlefield and Goliath is making his taunts and making his, his uh, remarks. And uh, David asked, what, do you get the, what, is, what does the man get that kills him? And his brothers got mad at him. And Pastor Michelle and I both taught on it Sunday morning. He said, is there not a cause? Is that right? And he said, then he asked those men, notice what he said. He said, who is this un?" circumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. 
Now, now notice what he pointed to. He pointed, number one, he does not understand this. He understood he doesn't have a covenant, so he does not have the power or the ability. Who is he to defy God? And he pointed to the fact that he does not have a covenant. Do do you see that? This spoke to him. He doesn't have a covenant, so why are we letting him talk like that? Amen. And then he talked to Saul, and Saul said, you're just a youth. And David said, well, your servant, a lion came and took a lamb, a bear came and took a lamb, and I killed him. Remember that? And then what did he say? And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. No, it, it, there was not a question. There was not a question in David's mind, could he defeat the lion and the bear? He just went and did it. There was not a question in his mind that I'm up against a guy without a covenant. Victory sure for me. Why? Because God is on the side of the covenant. He's bound to it. God can never be against the covenant. Because he's bound to it. That's important to understand. Hallelujah. So that's what David pointed to. The fact that he does not have a covenant He does not have any blood between him and God. There's blood between you and God. There's something that binds you to the word of God and binds you to God's word. And that's the blood. It binds you to it. Do do you remember uh, Saul on Mount Gilboa, 1 Samuel 31 and 4, when he asked his armor bearer, He said, uh, take your sword and thrust me through. And what did he say? Lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. That that was how they referred to people with no covenant. Amen. See, there, there, there was blood there. This was evidence or proof that God had a covenant with the person or persons who possessed the sign of the covenant in their body. And they did not walk around telling people they possessed this sign. It was evidence to them. It empowered them. It emboldened them. It was evidence to them. Notice in Exodus 12. Exodus chapter 12. And verse 12. And we'll read through verse 13. It says, I, God said, I will pass through the, the land of Egypt this night. And I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token. Now, there's that word token again. Upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, now this is important. Because he uses the word token. Sign. Evidence. Well, a sign or evidence of something. Now, remember, God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 17... He says, no of a surety that your your descendants will go into bondage and they will be in bondage for 400 years. Right? Why would they go into bondage? Because they forgot God. For 400 years, they forgot God. But God is bound to the covenant. So God is bound to covenant people. You know, we say things in the church sometimes, the mercy of God never runs out. Why? He's bound to His Word. He's bound to it. By by the blood, He's bound to His Word. So here's a group of people that had forgotten God. If you remember reading in Exodus chapter uh, 2, it says that the children of Israel 
sighed because of the bondage, and they cried. It doesn't say they cried to God. I've heard people say that. It does not say that. It says they cried. And it says God heard their cry and remembered his covenant. Now, we know they didn't think much of God because just a few days after they were across the Red Sea and they're in the, in the, land of, uh, in the wilderness, they make a golden calf to go back to Egypt. The golden calf was one of the premier gods of Egypt. They knew all about Egypt's gods. Aaron knew how to make it. <laughs> you, you understand? What I'm saying is they forgot covenant. God didn't. He remembered it. And he said, put the blood on the doorpost, and the blood will be a token of something. It will be evidence of something. What is it evidence of? Covenant people reside in this house. Glory to God. Amen. Do, 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 do you see this? There, this is evidence. That blood is evidence. That there's a covenant person here. And notice what had to happen. The destruction had to pass over. That's why Psalm 91 and verse 10, remember what it says? It says, if you, Psalm 91, 1, If you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91, 10, And no evil will befall you, and no plague will come near your dwelling. If, uh, most of the promises that you find in the Old Testament have a parallel with a picture of this covenant. If they stay in the house, the destruction passes over. If you stay in the secret place and you abide under the shadow of the Almighty, no evil will befall you and no plague will come near your dwelling. Why? Because it's a token, it's evidence that there's a covenant person that lives here. Glory to God. Any attempt to cross that bloodline was a violation of their covenant. And it would incur the wrath of God. Amen. Hallelujah. See, Pharaoh got in trouble, not just because he wouldn't listen to God, but he was oppressing covenant people. And God said, Abraham, the people that bless you, I will bless. And those that curse you, I will curse. See, that's important. That was because of the covenant. God, look at the mercy of God. God. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, Thus says the Lord, let my people go. That's your chance right there. Let them go. But what Pharaoh said, so who's the Lord that I should obey him? Right? Well, now you're dealing with covenant people. God's got a covenant with them. Right? I mean, think about this. Moses doesn't want to be there. Aaron probably doesn't want to be there. The people got mad because Moses was making things rough on them, or they thought. And, and, and what's God do? He overlooks that. The people are belly aching in Egypt. They're griping in Egypt. Look what you did. You've made it harder on us. You said you were going to deliver us, and you've made it harder on us. Just shut up. Don't say anything. And what's God do? He, he remembers the covenant. Amen. Those plagues were not God's anger. They were God's deliverance of his covenant people. It's the extent that God will go to to set his covenant people free. God loves everybody. He loved everybody in the Old Testament. He gave everybody an op opportunity. Egypt had an opportunity to let the people go, and they could have kept thriving as a nation. Amen. But God, when, when God is in covenant with a man or a woman, God is in covenant with covenant people, he will go to whatever length necessary to make sure they come out of it right. Oh, glory. Do you see that? And he's bound to that. 
He, he put up with their unbelief for 40 years because he was bound to them. How many times when you read through uh, Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, do you see the people griping and complaining and, and God is going to judge them and he's going to destroy them? And, he, and then it says, and God remembered his covenant. Right? God remembered his covenant. And so what did he do? Finally, finally, he just let them go. He just let them go. And they wandered in the wilderness till they died. Oh, hallelujah. Because he was bound to his covenant. If you can see that tonight, there are things that God is bound to because of the covenant. And our part of it is faith and obedience. And we'll get more into that next week. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Oh, glory. Matthew 26 and 28. Whew. Jesus at Passover night. Now, isn't this interesting? Passover night, when the blood was put on the doorpost as a token, as a sign, as evidence that covenant people are here. And then Jesus says, for this is my blood. Now notice that. I don't know if you've ever read it that way. This is my blood. The blood of a lamb was put on the doorpost. And on Passover night, he says, this is my blood. Now notice. Of. This is my blood. Of. The New Testament or the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Living Bible says this is my blood sealing the New Covenant. Now, now think about this for a moment. We, we don't want to just read this without understanding the setting. He's emphasizing something. We've been celebrating blood on a doorpost. I'm telling you, this is my blood, the sealing of the new covenant. The English, the, the, today's English says, this is my blood that seals God's covenant. The Bible is a covenant book sealed with blood on both ends. The blood of the covenant of Abraham on the front end, the blood of the Lamb of God on the back end. It seals it. It's sealed by blood. Jerusalem Bible says, For this is my blood, the blood of the covenant. The blood of the covenant. In other words, whether they understood all of that or not that night, Jesus is saying, There's a second covenant being cut right here. There's a new covenant being cut. And my blood is the seal of it. The blood of Jesus is the blood, the token, the proof, the evidence of the new covenant. My brother, sister, when you say your heart is washed in the blood of Jesus, you're saying something that you may not know that you're saying. You're saying, I bear the token, I bear the evidence, I bear the proof that I'm in covenant with Almighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the evidence that we've entered into the new covenant. The first covenant was and is everlasting. But notice something. It can be added to and expanded by the second. All the provision of the old covenant, the first covenant, we have a right to. But we have a provision under the new covenant that is basically this by grace through faith we have access to the name of Jesus we have we have access to the throne room by the new covenant but that could only happen because I was brought into the family of Abraham by one of the seed of Abraham God told Abraham 
in you, in your seed, shall all nations be blessed. We talked about this last Wednesday. And then Matthew 1, 1 says, This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so being the son of Abraham, he was someone that could bless the entire earth. When he went to the cross and shed his blood and died on the cross so that he could go into the belly of the earth and redeem all of mankind and pay the price, spirit, soul, and body for mankind. And he rose on the third day. He rose and he took that covenant blood, the token, the proof, the evidence of the new covenant to the mercy seat in heaven and placed it on the mercy seat in heaven. And that token blood, that evidentiary blood, that proof blood is still living and speaking on the mercy seat today. And when you go into the heavenly holy of holies, it's with boldness because you've got the sign of spiritual circumcision in your body and you have a right to be there. Glory to God. It, God is bound by that. God is bound by that. And that's why he could say things like, if you ask anything in my name, the Father will do it for you. If any of you shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, you'll have whatever you say. God's bound by that. Oh, hallelujah. Let me hurry a little bit. <laughs> As believers, we're the seed of Abraham. And we have a right to all the provision of the first covenant. Through the blood of the second covenant. I wasn't there when the first blood was shed. I wasn't there when the second blood was shed. But I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, His blood was applied to my heart. Amen. My heart was circumcised. you you, you got to understand, we're going to read that in a minute. When you became a new creature, what happened? You know, it was, it was spiritual, but your life was circumcised. The old you was cut off. The old you was taken away. Glory to God. The changed life. The new creature is evidence. It's the token. It's the proof that you have a covenant with God. Oh, hallelujah. Without the token of the second covenant, the blood of Jesus, we cannot be brought into the blessing of the first covenant. If there's not the second token, I can't be brought into... The first covenant. Romans 2.29. Now, remember that Romans, Romans was written to Gentiles, but oh my goodness, it, it, it is just a, a picture of, Of this covenant. He says in verse 29. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Now I've heard people say. Well you know you can't take that literally. Well now wait a minute. I got to take the Bible literally wherever possible. One of the first laws of biblical interpretation. Is interpret the Bible literally wherever possible. And Paul said here. He is not a Jew that's one inwardly. And uh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart. Remember what circumcision was proof. Evidence of what covenant. You know, sometimes we say this, you know, well, I can't see I can't see your heart, so I don't know. Well, that's true. I in reality, I can't see your heart. I can't see. The mark of circumcision on your heart. But yet, if you're born again, it's there. That's why the Bible says, and, and, and God was talking about the, the hidden motives of Eliab, but God doesn't change. 
When Samuel stood before Eliab, he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is standing before me. And what God say? Don't look on his statue or his appearance. For I do not look on men as men look upon them. I look on the heart. So what's God looking? The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for those that he can show himself strong on the behalf of. Who can God show himself strong on the behalf of? Anybody that has the mark of covenant in their body. So notice, circumcision is still the token, but it's not a natural affair. It's a spiritual one. It's a spiritual issue. Hallelujah. People will say, you know, when, when I got born again, everything changed. It's, it's because that old you, that old nature was cut off. It was cut off. Amen. And, and you became a new creature because the old creature was cut off. What enabled that? What brought that about? The blood of the first covenant brought you into the second, the blood of the second covenant brought you into the first covenant with all of its provision, but the blood of the second covenant provided you with a new creaturehood. And God's bound by that. Nobody gets saved and stays the same. If your part is faith and obedience, When you get born again and you put faith in what God did for you and you're obedient to what God said about you, you have faith that you're righteous and you're obedient to right. Remember what he said in in, uh, uh, the book of Romans? He said that that, that the Jewish people, that they did not, they had not, uh, they had not submitted themselves unto the righteousness which is of faith. And so they were still going about trying to set up their own righteousness. And he said, you can't do that because that was how you did it under the first covenant. But under the new covenant, you are righteous by faith. Faith in what? Faith in what God did for you. Every, every, right? Every time you look in the Spirit and you see that mark of circumcision, yeah, I'm righteous. Oh, I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm, amen. Hallelujah. Whew. The NIV says, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. It's a spiritual affair. The evidence that we have a covenant with God is in our hearts, our changed hearts. Galatians 3. Galatians 3. See, this is the importance of, of you remembering, I have a covenant. Galatians 3 and verse uh, 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. That's not where I wanted to go. Mm hmm. But I know it's here. It's the scripture. You, you, you know the, the, the scripture. It says this. It says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creature. But a new creature. I've, evidently, I wrote that down wrong. But nonetheless, the NIV says what counts is a new creation. What counts is a new creation. So the covenant that God made with Abraham is the channel through which he's been able to accomplish his redemptive work in the earth. That's the, that's the channel. That's the basis of our relationship with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at Hebrews 13. This will be our last scripture because uh, this tells us this. Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Notice what it says. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, Now notice, 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Three times in Genesis 17, he called the covenant with Abraham the everlasting covenant. Three times. So notice, it was through, that word through, it was the channel, that was the passage, that was the conduit that God could use to not only get Jesus into the earth, but to raise him from the dead. The covenant you have is stronger than death. You understand? Why? Because God, now, 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 see, I'm not going to get into this tonight because I, I, I know we got to watch our time. But do you remember now why the Bible says that, that Abraham, in Abraham's mind, Isaac was as good as dead and God received it that way? He received him in a figure. In God's mind, Abraham went through with it. In Abraham's mind, Isaac was as good as dead. You understand? And so, figuratively speaking, Isaac was raised from the dead. You tracking with me? Figuratively speaking, Isaac was raised from the dead. Well, if he was dead and raised from the dead in God's mind, if he was dead and raised from the dead in Abraham's mind, right? Then there was a part when Jesus died and said it is finished and went into the grave and went into the belly of the earth, there was only part of it done. The rest of the covenant had to be consummated. God had to raise him from the dead for the covenant to be fulfilled. Woo! And he did it. And he did it because he was bound to it by the blood of the first covenant. He was bound to the blood of the first covenant. And Jesus knew that. And that's why he could say, you won't leave me in hell. You won't leave me in hell. There, there, there's blood between you and I. You will not leave me here. As a matter of fact, Jesus was on Mount Moriah and was the one that spoke to Abraham. It says the angel of the Lord called out to Abraham. And all throughout the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is a picture of Jesus Christ. And all throughout that, that, that first covenant, we see the angel of the Lord. And here's the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, watching Abraham go through figuratively, go through with the entire process, and he sees him figuratively raised from the dead, and he knows there's blood between him and God, and he's willing to do whatever he's got to do because God's going to raise him from the dead because he's bound to it by covenant blood. You have a covenant. You have a covenant. It's, it's, it's stronger than anything you face. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think about this. It's, it's stronger than the death of any believer. Because they, they might be waiting right now for the redemption of their bodies. But because of that blood, one day, the, the trump of God is going to sound. The voice of the archangel is going to be heard. And one day, the dead in Christ will rise again. And we will be reunited because of that blood. Hallelujah. See, God's bound to that. And so, when you say things like, I'm the healed of the Lord. And you don't necessarily feel it or you don't necessarily see it. You're saying something and you're declaring what God is bound to by blood. If, 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 if I could, I believe you're seeing it, but if, if I could get you, boy, if I could just paint a picture. God bound to that word. He's bound to it. Have, have you ever found yourself in a situation that you're really, you know, may, maybe you had promised something 
and you weren't really that into it, but what do we say? Your word's out there. I made a promise. You know, like when you promise your brother-in-law you'd help him move. <laughs> and, and you're, man, and you can't lie, you know. Well, your word's out there. Well, think about this. On a much bigger scale, God's word's out there. Anything God called himself, I'm your healer. I'm your provider. I'm your peace. I'm your way maker. I'm your defender. I'm your rock. I'm your high tower. I'm your refuge. I'm your forgiver. I'm your redeemer. Anything that God has put his word out, he's bound to it. And he's bound to it by the blood. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. That's how I know that you're going to be okay. Because you got a covenant. Amen. That says, that says, that says, your peace will be great. And great will be the peace of your children. Hallelujah. You have a successive covenant for each generation. And God will keep his word to his, your children just like he's kept his word to you because his word is out there and it's bound by blood. Oh, glory. Glory. 